Hi everyone and welcome to Insights from Cumberland County College. My name is Kevin McGarvey. Thanks for being here today. Before we get started with today's show, I want to pay tribute to a friend of the program. Uh, Francis J. Riley passed away in late February. Francis J. Riley was a, a good friend of the college, of the program, and a tremendous supporter of the violin community. And I simply want to send out my condolences to the Riley family. Uh, his voice will be missed. My guest today is Lisa Mellion. She is a Renaissance woman, if anyone ever was. Lisa is a speech therapist. She is a vegan, and we'll talk about that. And she is also a percussionist, not a drummer. I said drummer before, and she said, no, I am a percussionist. <laughs> uh, we'll cover all three of Lisa's lives. Lisa, thanks so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you for that introduction, Kevin, and thanks for having me. Lisa, we're going to talk about your whole life, those three parts of uh, Lisa Million, the Venn diagram. Let's start <laughs> with speech therapy. What, what are your major duties as a speech therapist? What does a speech therapist do? Well, as a speech therapist, I get to work with a lot of great people. And right now, I work with senior citizens mostly. Uh, I work in a nursing home, and I just love that population. I mean, they're the last people to ever have farms, it seems, around here. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they're just great. Um, you can work as a speech therapist from age zero to however high it goes. I mean, that's the beauty of it. I used to work with kids under three, zero to three, early intervention it was called. Um, and I'd go to their homes, work with the parents, and encourage language, encourage understanding, um, things like that, with um, autism becoming very prevalent. We had teachers, um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists in that avenue. Uh, I always did want to work with adults, though. Mm -hmm. So then I kind of transitioned. I worked in a hospital, Cooper Hospital, for one year. And that's where I got my experience working. And you wonder, speech therapy in a hospital, what do you do? You know, you're not teaching them to speak, yeah, you exactly. to speak. Tell or us. You're really dealing with swallowing. I mean, it used to be under the occupational therapy heading. Now it's under the speech therapy heading, and swallowing can be a very significant issue um, when you're dealing with older people, when you're dealing with people with strokes, with serious medical issues. Many of them are at risk for choking. Exactly, and that's called aspiration, mm -hmm. when food or drink goes into your lungs. Now there's two ways. We have the windpipe for the, you know, the larynx, where the airflow goes into your lungs and comes out, and then you have the pharynx and the esophagus where the food and drink go. Mm -hmm. So there's two pipes. And you know, if you've ever had an experience of choking or starting to choke, it's not very comfortable. And you, we have safety mechanisms, coughing, clearing your throat, mm -hmm. getting it out of the wrong pipe. And so one of the tricks that we do teach people is when you're going to swallow and you're at risk for choking, put your head down when you swallow. Now, that's really an important thing to do. Um, now, this goes for everyone, doesn't it? I this mean, goes for everybody. You told me a story about almost choking on a French fry one time. And I mentioned to you that, you know, I take antibiotics once in a while, and the, they're like horse pills, gigantic pills. A lot of people take medication, so just to even take their pills, they should... Excellent point, especially with pills. Go ahead. I mean, we're so used to thinking, put your head back, it'll mm -hmm. go right down. Well, it might go right down the wrong way. So, I mean, you still have to get that pill back, but then when you're about to swallow, take the sip and put your chin down, because that covers the opening of the airway, so nothing goes that way. Um, so I was in a diner with friends, laughing, and a french fry was starting to go the wrong way. So I remember thinking, it was almost like an accident happening in slow motion. I remember thinking, as funny as this is, I really have to stop laughing. So I did that. Then I said, oh, now I have to put my head down. And I did that, and it just went the right way. But it was close. Meanwhile, was close. everyone around you was just... <laughs> Watching with wonderment, mouths wide open. Yeah, it was, it was uh, well, it was a split second. They didn't really know. And um, as people get older, their, their swallowing muscles get weaker, you told me. Yes, um, yes. Not just learning or teaching people uh, how to swallow and to keep from choking. You teach thinking skills as well. 
right. as a speech therapist, and that's something that surprised me. And I think that probably surprises a lot of people. They don't realize sure. that's what a speech therapist does. What kind of thinking skills are, are, are we talking about? Well, the name speech therapist really is called speech language pathologist. Okay. And that's a huge, important sounding name. Uh, so I like to just say speech therapist, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, speech language pathology. So the pathology is really when something goes wrong. That's what pathology is. Um, I used to think, oh, I'm going into speech therapy so I can stop people from saying nuclear and they can say nuclear, but it uh -huh. really wasn't as simple as all that. <laughs> and that's another story that maybe we'll get to, uh, how I got into it. But um, what it is, is there's four different areas. There's speech is how you say what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. Language is what are you saying. Mm -hmm. So. When you say, what are you saying, there's saying and then there's understanding. So that's expressive language is what you're saying, your expression, and comprehension or receptive language is what you're understanding. So of course there's two parts to speaking. And we're talking about all kinds of people. We're talking about people that uh, are recovering from strokes. We're talking Definitely. about people with Alzheimer's disease. We're talking about various types of dementia. We're yeah. talking about people recovering from brain injuries. Right. You work with, with that all those populations. I do. And then there's the whole school age population, which you're predominantly dealing with uh, in the younger kids, the speech production, the sounds that they aren't getting. Mm -hmm. And then as you get a little older, it's, well, as well as the comprehension. And as you get a little older, it's not so much about the speech, but more about the language. What mm -hmm. are they saying? Can they put a cohesive thought together, mm -hmm. you know, and that goes hand in hand with your with your English skills that you sure. need for writing, mm -hmm. comprehending. And yet, uh, you prefer to work with the older people. You you said just a few moments ago, you would go to the homes of the young children. Right. But I know from knowing you over the years too that um, you really get a lot of satisfaction from working with older people. In fact, yeah. you were telling me about a hundred and three year old woman before the show. Right. I have a woman who's 103 on my caseload, and uh, she, she's great. She had gone to the hospital and come back with pneumonia, and she had trouble drinking after that. She would cough, um, and maybe that was one of the reasons she got pneumonia, because when something goes into your lungs, it could wash down bacteria or just the particles themselves or the liquids. So we thicken her liquids now. She's on nectar thick liquids. Mm -hmm. So people in the nursing home or in the subacute care setting, um, we can change their diets. Uh, liquids, there's regular liquids, nectar liquids, and honey thick liquids, which is the thickest. Mm -hmm. And I don't really recommend that. Um, it's just so hard. It's just so slow and it could get caught up in their throat. But the nectar liquids is nice because it's slower. You know, regular liquids, you don't have time to, it, it's just, it runs right down. And that's what these people don't have time to control. They don't have the, the muscle power, the, you know, everything's slowing down. Um, you told me there were four elements of, of speech therapy. I'd like, to, ah, yes. I'd like to just kind of go into each one individually. Okay. Um, cognition, speech production, language, and dysphagia. Exactly. Okay. Very good, Kevin. I, well, I have them written down oh. here. Um, <laughs> Cognition. Okay. Cognition. Um, that involves several things. Uh, well, it really involves everything. It's, it's how you think. It's how you move your body, what, what your brain is saying to you. And we deal with orientation. First of all, a person comes into a place, they're older, they're a little disoriented, possibly dementia is coming on, maybe they've had a stroke. So it's the four questions. Who are you? Which they usually do know. If they didn't, it might be hard to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, who are you? Where are you? Uh, temporal orientation. What month is it? What year is it? Uh, what season is it? And why are you here? Well, what are you doing here? You know, what's your purpose? What kind of place is this? So that's general orientation. Do you remember me telling you the story about my dad and the donuts? Yes. Could let I'd me, like let me to do just repeat that. Yeah. Um, my dad died a few years ago. And about two months before he had his heart attack, um, we were in a supermarket together in Florida. And we were 
at the cash register, we were paying for everything, and he had a bag of donuts that he had, had bought at the, at the bakery. Yeah. And I said, Dad, you have to pay for the donuts. And he said, I paid for the donuts. And I said, no, you didn't. I was with you. He said, I paid for the donuts. They were 69 cents a piece, six of them, that's, and his math was perfect. And he said, I gave him a $5 bill. They gave me, you know, and I knew he hadn't paid for the donuts. And I had to make an executive decision on the spot. Now, what do I do? Do I anger him and, you know, uh, let him, do I let him walk out of the store without paying for the donuts or not? Um, yeah, I that's thought it was just, you know, maybe he hadn't slept well the night before, he's getting older, he's getting a little bit forgetful. What could, what could have been done at that moment? That's something that you see all the time. That would be the beginning of exactly. dementia, the beginning of... of yeah, because you, it, it's really not, it wasn't him, it wasn't like him. You were surprised. And that's the beginnings of dementia, which could have been definitely brought on by the trauma that he suffered with his, you said he had heart issues recently, right? Mm -hmm. And he had a bypass. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, you use the word executive decision, and that's true. Executive functioning definitely can be impaired uh, with the onset of dementia. And we help people in that sort of setting deal with safety issues. And that's why they receive the therapies they do. Um, they receive physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, usually in the rehab. Um, and they aren't safe a lot of times. Uh, they think they can get up and walk. Right. So physical therapy targets the lower half of their body, the walking, their legs. Um, what about medication? Are, are, are there any really effective medications that can slow dementia? Well, or there are some. I mean, I really can't speak to... Uh, to that, I'm, you know, that's more of a nursing doctoral issue, but I, there are some. I don't know how much, mm -hmm. how, how effective they are. Mm -hmm. Well, let's to go to the next one. Speech production is, a, is an important element. Yeah. Um, discuss that. Well, like the, you were saying, the four areas. Mm -hmm. um, the speech, we talked about that, uh, is the actual production. So in that, you can have the fluency or the disfluency, which is stuttering. Uh, you can have voice issues, which is a whole other specialty. Um, y you could have dysphonia. You know, you don't have your voice. Um, breath support issues. What is that? What does that mean, dysphonia? Um, it mean well, phonation is your your voice. Dysphonia is without your voice. So there's a whole range of. Uh, you could have reflux that could affect your voice. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things that y even just old age can affect your vocal cords. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's sort of another specialty. There are a lot of speech therapists who work just on voice. Um, we touch on that. And so this is all part of speech production. But then the cognition is a whole separate part, which we work on a lot in the subacute nursing home setting uh, with, the, like I said, the orientation. The memory is a big one. We can help them with that because they're very disoriented. You can, really. That's, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. I mean, you can go over the important facts, the important new issues that they need to know, and you can even have a memory card for them. And you told me you're simply naming things, pointing at things and repeating the words, yeah. repeating the names of things. Spaced retrieval is a technique where you you space it out. Uh, you say something, and this is the name of the place, this is where you are, let's mm -hmm. go over it again, mm -hmm. and the third time they can do it. In fact, I have a story about my grandmother. Every time she got in the car with me, she would say, Lisa, why do these cars have their lights on mm -hmm. and it's daytime every time? Mm -hmm. And I would tell her, well, these are new cars. They're made that way with their lights on for safety. So finally, I started saying, why do you think? And she would answer. And that's spaced retrieval. Yeah, so using the Socratic method and asking, asking her questions. Exactly. I see. What is dysphagia? Uh, dysphagia. That means, well, what it means is difficulty swallowing. Um, I did want to say a couple more things with the cognition. Problem solving and reasoning is a big thing, mm -hmm. um, which all ties in with the safety issue. And a lot of these people lived on their own before, and they have a medical issue, and now they're in the nursing home, and the question is, can they go back to live on their own? So we deal with problem solving and reasoning skills. And these are people that are not just confused, but quite frustrated, Yes, and scared. Being away from home and being and scared. And, right. And being
being on their own, sure. Right. So there's different things we work with to try to get them up to speed, and, and, and maybe we realize, well, they're not safe to go back on their own. Mm. So they have to think of other. We have about a minute left in this segment. How did you get interested in this? You're, you, you're so talented, Lisa. You're, you're uh. good at so many things. <laughs> How did you This was really interesting. It was, uh, I was in church. It happened to be Easter Sunday. And my mother called me over because a woman we knew was retiring from this profession called speech therapy. Mm. So she said, Lisa, come over here. I think you'd really like to hear about this because you're always correcting my speech. <laughs> so I ran over there and it really sounded interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was something that really touched my sensibilities. It's not for everybody, but, uh, but I liked it. And I went back to school and you have to get a master's degree in order to really be a speech therapist. Where'd you go to school? I went to Temple for my master's. Mm -hmm. So I had an undergrad that I wasn't using uh, and 10 years later I went back. So I had to go for a year of prerequis prerequisites, excuse me, uh, hearing science, um, speech, linguistics courses, mm -hmm. and you know that's and then the bulk of the courses the next two years. So, I mean, it is a great field. There's so many options, and some people want to work in the school system because they like that population. Well, those people are awful lucky to have you oh. there working with them, too. Well, thanks. Um, we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Lisa the vegan. Okay. And we're going to talk about Lisa the drummer. Okay. okay? Well, percussionist, so, not drummer. Percussionist. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be back with the second half of Insights in just a moment. Hi, I'm Larry Kane in the Cumberland Mall. All the best to everybody at Cumberland County Community College. Your success begins there. Thanks for staying with us for the second half of Insights. My guest is Lisa Melian, Renaissance woman, uh, speech therapist, a vegan, and percussionist. And we're going to be talking about um, Lisa the vegan for the next few minutes and I know this is something you're really excited about yeah okay here we go now I thought that veganism just had to do with food and nutrition when I said that to you you had lightning bolts coming out of your eyes you said no 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 <laughs> it's a whole way of life yeah. what is veganism what's, what's it all about well the word vegan well let me let me go back and explain these terms for people who may not know vegetarian is you just don't eat meat the flesh of animals, uh, fish, animals, any beings. And veganism takes it a step further where you don't really use animals for anything. You don't, you don't, eat the, you don't consume the milk, the eggs. Um, and it may sound extreme, but what, what's going on is horrific for the animals. I mean, it's just, they're like treated like plastic. They're just they're slaughtered thousands and thousands per second, I would say, uh, billions per year. And the numbers are really unfathomable. And it's, it's really different now that we're feeding the masses and we have all these sophisticated machineries to just, you know, once I heard about it, I had to stop. I couldn't participate anymore. And it's so easy to do this, to be mm -hmm. vegan, to not eat animal products. It, it seems maybe like it's something very difficult, but it isn't. I mean, they have everything out there now the same. I mean, you could go into ShopRite and get vegan cream cheese. Mm. Imagine that. Uh, you could go into Pathmark at uh, Acme and get a whole slew of ice creams of different flavors that you would never know was not cow's milk because they have coconut milk, soy milk, all this, you know, all these other substitutes. Uh, for animal products. So we really don't even need to eat it anymore. And plus, you know, they say we're killing animals and they're killing us. I mean, the, the diseases. Mm -hmm. Well, hold on. Yeah. Before, before we get there. Now, so, so basically you're saying that um, veganism not only is nutrition-based, but it's based on compassion for animals as well. Right. So right. what if, th what if the, the methods of production um, were different? were cleaner, were more, were more ethical somehow. Would that, a good would question. that change? Would that change? That's your, your a good point question. Um, you know, you're killing something. Y you can always, p whenever I substitute humans in that equation, I, it really makes sense. So, you know, let's say 
this was humans we're talking about. You know, and you say, well, if you just kill them, you know, all of a sudden it doesn't compute. You get it. I mean, you can't kill something humanely. Um, first of all, to feed the amount of people we have here, there are more cows in this country than there are people, mm. believe it or not. And also the manure from the cows. I mean, for each person, there is a pile of manure, two tons of it for each person that's living. Mm -hmm. And this, there's no sewage system. It just goes straight into the earth, into the groundwater, into the lakes. I mean, the environmental devastation is horrific. Okay, so you're saying that it's bad all around, and, and you started to say before that right. our diets are so high in, in meat and dairy products. And yeah, any diet, I mean, Johns Hopkins, for people who like scientific uh, information or research, came out two years ago saying that any diet high in meat and dairy is directly linked to cancer. Um, what about all those, those people that adhere to the Atkins diet? I, I've had plenty of uh, friends who swear by Atkins and they've lost a lot of weight and they're they eating, probably they're eating will. nothing but meat and they, avoiding you know all carbohydrates. You can lose weight and you can look great, but you can't see inside. You know, you can't see the arteries and, and what's going on. I mean, how many people left and right are having bypass surgery? Um, you know, their carotid arteries are getting filled up with plaque. And take milk, for example. I mean, what a cow gives milk for who? I mean, who's, who's a cow's milk for, well, right? The calf. Mm -hmm. The calf to grow 300 pounds in a year. Um, we're the only species that drinks the milk of another species, mm. especially after the age of weaning, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we produce milk for our babies, not for our adults. You're not a fettuccine Alfredo fan. You, what, what did you call it, a heart attack on a plate? Right, that's the term for it. Um, but I love fettuccine Alfredo, uh -huh. and there is a great vegan recipe for that. And my friends, who they love it. You know, some people, that's their favorite dish, and they love this version. You said the whole Betty Crocker cookbook had been basically rewritten for, for, for vegans. Exactly. Is that, is that for real? Right. Well, let me go back to the fettuccine Alfredo. Go ahead. You know, normally it's heavy cream, milk, butter, eggs, who knows. But this is cashews, lemon juice, garlic, mm. salt, water, pepper. Mm. Um, and the industry is so horrifically cruel. I mean, especially even eggs. You know, you would think, well, don't they just give eggs? I mean, yeah. But these chickens say there's about 10,000 in a warehouse. They don't even see light. They don't even feel the grass. They're mm -hmm. in cages. They can barely move and they can barely breathe with the, the uh, ammonia from all the, the fecal matter. And it's, it's no way to live even for a second. It's, mm. it's horrific. And yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. And the issue with the cows, with the milk. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm not saying this sounds easy to do overnight. It certainly doesn't. I mean, I was vegetarian pretty much overnight. Um, it's, it took me a while to get off the fish. Uh, and that's, but when I, but the milk, um, the cows are given all these hormones and they produce about 300% more milk than they normally would. So that in itself is painful. Well, that's pretty much a problem throughout the entire <gasps> industry, yes. right? Yes. Let me, let me ask you a quick yeah. question. My, my son has been, a ve has been a vegetarian since he was eight years old. We were in Washington, D.C., and we bought a hot dog from a vendor in front of the, the Library of Congress. It was one of those big, pink, you know, thick hot dogs. Yeah. It tasted like aluminum foil. And I remember him spitting it out and saying, I'm never eating meat again. Now, now that's he's 27. Amazing. And so he's been a vegetarian for 20 years. And mm. every day somebody says to him, where do you get your protein? That's it's a just great one of those question. questions that he hears all the time and his, he, he rolls his eyes. Yeah. And when people say that to you, what do you, what do you say? I do roll my eyes, but in this case, I'm not going to because it's a great question. Um, and it's an easy answer. Gorillas, elephants, giraffes, they are vegetarians. They're one of the strongest animals in the jungle. I mean, you know, they get their protein from the leaves. Mm -hmm. um, I never worried about protein, ever. Uh, I've been vegetarian for like 25 years. Hmm. People say, you know, you can eat nuts, seeds, beans, tofu. I never cooked. I never cooked a bean. I never made anything with tofu. But 15 years after being vegetarian, I became vegan basically because it was a, 
a story that happened during Lent. I, I was vegan for Lent, and then I, I just got it. Everything clicked. And then I started cooking, and I started loving it. And then I started teaching cooking classes, basically saying, here's a person who doesn't know how to cook, but I can read a recipe and follow directions. Okay, so, you're, so, so what you're saying to me is that we're not really talking about omitting anything, about uh, taking things that we love out of our lives. We're no. talking about making life more exciting and interesting and adding variety, Excellent right? Excellent point, yeah. For most people, uh, or a lot of people who eat the SAD diet, well, that's an acronym for Standard American Diet, uh -huh. where you have the meat, the potato clump, and the, the vegetable clump, mm -hmm. They think being vegetarian or vegan is taking, well, the meat clump out, right. and I guess the potato clump, because mm -hmm. that's got milk and butter, mm -hmm. but it's not that at all. It's not about what you're giving up. You're not giving up things. It's, it's about abundance. There's so much out there that's incredible and good to eat, and it's about liberation. I mean, you're liberating uh, the, the animals from this horrific, I mean, the environmental devastation, uh, the health issues, but, but more importantly, you know, the animals themselves. It's, it's not about, you know, oh, they're dumb animals. Well, there's dumb people. I mean, it's not can they think, you know, it's not can they, what can they do, they can't speak. It's can they suffer. Okay, part of the, sol it's part of the solution. Yeah. In the real world, economic drive what people do, right. people's health drives what people do. There right. are people watching us right now who perhaps don't feel all that healthy, perhaps don't have a lot of energy. Yeah. They don't want to change their entire lives. They don't want to make some gigantic, profound commitment. What simple, small steps can they do just to feel better and add some, some variety into their lives? Small steps are great. I mean, whatever, whenever you choose something to eat, you can choose a non-meat thing. I mean, even if it's once a week, start there and start learning about it. I mean, for me, the hardest thing it was the fish. But the more I learned, and then I would say, well, what's wrong with having some shrimp at a wedding, the free shrimp? I mean, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, but then I heard that they throw these nets out, three football fields long, mm. and shrimp are bottom feeders. So when they bring it all up, only 10% is the shrimp. The other 90%? Dolphins, birds, turtles, other fish, they're mm -hmm. all killed. Mm -hmm. They're all killed at a slow, horrifying death. Lisa, you're not going to believe this. We have about a minute left in the program. No. I wanted to talk about uh, Lisa the Percussionist. Uh, you're part of the Millville art scene, ah, and you love it down there on High I Street, do. don't you? Millville is such a great little town. Um, it's just it's just a hub of, of arts and music, and it's, it's just great. There's so many great musicians that I am privileged to accompany and play with. Like? Like uh, the Troubadour KP. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Smith. Smith mm -hmm. Singer, what a, songwriter, what a guy. Tom Waits style. He also mm -hmm. runs a tomato taste off at Bogarts mm -hmm. every year. And Amy's great. Bogarts mm -hmm. uh, is a bookstore that just is like the center of town, and mm -hmm. Amy runs it, and she's wonderful. Terrific place. How music happens there. Jody um, Janetta? Jody Janetta, a great friend of mine, great drummer. He has his improvisational jazz band, Adelante. They've been around for a while. Oh, they're terrific. Yeah. Um, sitar Bob has his own sitar stylings, uh, plays great ambient sitar music. Mm -hmm. um, Bob White, he's a singer-songwriter that uh, he's written over 100 songs, and he's got a really incredible style. Lisa, you're, you're terrific. I'm so glad that you're a friend of mine. I'm so glad that you're on the show. And can I just mention quickly one thing? Um, Nick Marley runs open mic nights several places in Millville, and I and it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention him. Thank you. He's great. We okay. gotta go. Thanks for Thanks, being on the Kevin, show. Thanks, Kevin. And may I end with a little? Go ahead. Thanks for being with us on Insights.